Welcome to the official podcast of Fourternia.com. We have the power. I'm your host, AJ, AKA Voodoo Magic, AKA Zor. And today we have a special guest joining us because this day, today, we will be commemorating a film and it's not just any ordinary movie, but one that is near and dear to so many Motu fans' hearts. So it's time to get our popcorn ready because we'll be talking the 1987 fantasy adventure film, Masters of the Universe, a movie that was released 35 years ago this week. And who better to co-host and celebrate this film's 35th anniversary than this wonderful person sitting with me who portrayed the character Pig Boy in the film, the evil servant to Lord Skeletor himself, no one other than Richard Sponder. Rich, I'm so happy you're here. Welcome. Hey, AJ. Thanks for having me. You know, uh, Rich and I were just talking off camera, and I was saying that he was he's really making me look like a Motu nerd here <laughs> because I have so much Motu stuff, and Rich looks so grown up. <laughs> <laughs> what you don't see on this wall is my uh my wonder woman painting and my disney villains stuff which is on this side of the wall so this is my my camera side for my work meetings but i've got all the good stuff on uh on that side so <laughs> so you're into those disney villains um did that oh, start yeah. recently with those disney movies or did that happen before that Oh, I've, I've, I've always loved the, the Disney villains. Yeah. It, for, for a long time, I've got, uh, my whole arm from here up is, uh, Maleficent and her dragon. So, uh, so you must love those two movies. Um, with yeah, the, the I did. yeah, I did. Yeah. Yeah. You know, the story took a turn from the traditional, but it was fun yeah. to watch. So, and I like that, uh, the 101 Dalmatian one. I can't remember what that was. I didn't watch that one. Oh, you haven't watched that one? No. Um, no. Well, Rich, uh, let's say this is making me feel old. Because <laughs> I was thinking that as you were saying, about to say 35 years. I was like, oh, man. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I mean, Masters of the Universe uh, was released on August 7th, uh, 1987. I believe there was a premiere a few days before that. Um, but I went to see it as a kid in the theater. I know you went to see it and played a role in it as a kid. Yeah. Can, can you believe it's been 35 years since the, uh, the film's debut? No, I still <laughs> remember going to the, the theater to see it. Um, and, uh, standing outside the theater and, and seeing the poster and, uh, the, um, the people at, uh, Mattel actually rented out a theater, uh, for, uh, for, for me and my friends and my family. So we had the whole theater to ourselves to see it. And, um, yeah, I still remember, I still remember that. Where have the days gone? Luckily we haven't aged a day. <laughs> Not a bit. <laughs> Not a bit. But I tell you what, before we get into all that, um, did you happen to watch the 2021 Netflix series, Masters of the Universe Revelation, and see a certain character make an appearance? <laughs> I did. I did. It was pretty, uh, pretty amazing. And uh, I just I just recently got the uh, book of artwork from that uh, from that series. And a certain character also shows up. Uh, you know, in the, uh, in the artwork, in the book as well. Which yeah, I think, cool. I think for our YouTube viewers, let me see here. Here we go. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, you gotta awesome. love them. Yeah. You know, we were the, uh, the day that the preview was released for, for that, you know, a few weeks or so before the, the series, uh, debuted on Netflix, I was just working one day and like my phone started blowing up out of, out of nowhere, you know, text messages and, uh, messages online. And I was like, what is going on? And, and it's amazing. You know, people have a really good eye because in the preview, it was like just this like flash, but I was getting all these, you know, screenshots and zoom zoomed in. And, uh, it was pretty amazing to, uh, to see that. Yeah. We just actually, um, I had the wonderful, I had a wonderful conversation with the writer of those episodes. Um, he's such a great guy. His name is Tim Sheridan. Um, in the previous 
episode. And he actually said it was the idea of um, uh, Ted Biaselli, you know, mm-hmm. the executive producer on the show. And uh, it was his idea to put Pig Boy in. And um, I just loved it. It was such an awesome idea of his. Yeah. And, um, and everyone, don't crucify me or Rich if we get anything wrong in this podcast. Um, but I believe that was the first time Pig Boy has ever appeared in another medium other than the 1987 film. I believe yeah. so. I can't, I can't think of another time. Yeah. It's pretty, uh, it's pretty neat. Ted actually reached out to me that day as well. And he said, Hey, did you happen to see anything online today? And uh, he told me a little, little story about, uh, you know, some of their creative meetings and, and, uh, how he proposed that idea. It's amazing to me that this many years later, right. That that still is, uh, a moment that that people remember it's just it's cool to be a, a part of that yeah i would imagine right if this was me who won that contest as a child back in 1986 to appear in the 1987 uh masters of the universe film and became immortalized um as this evil servant pig boy i feel this almost strange but unique ownership over the character, like a stewardship, um, regardless if I didn't legally own the property. So you, I mean, did you just feel like proud to see that in revelation? I mean, yeah. Yeah. You know, that was, that was really cool. It, it, uh, I mean, it felt like a gift, honestly, like I know it wasn't, but it, it, it felt like a gift to me and, and it felt like a gift to a lot of people because, uh, I mean, it's just, it's been cool. There have been, there have been, uh, um, like online petitions over the years to like get a, a character made, a toy made, right? There you go and sign a petition. People have sent me stuff and it's, uh, yeah, it's pretty, it's pretty cool how the, uh, the, the character just, you know, resonates as one of those, um, you know, fun little moments and it's cool. They did a lot of really cool stuff in that series like if you know your stuff right you you catch things and there's other uh there's other like nods to the movie as well you know certain lines that uh some of the characters say and and you know there, there's some other nods to the movie that are that are in there and it's just really cool yeah the ones i could remember is um this will be our final battle yeah you know? yeah uh-huh um, um we see the those flying discs that he-man rides yeah um a really deep deep easter egg is um when tila i think it's episode two is wearing this mask and searching for this this object called the glove of god no, the glove of gobula okay. um that she's using a scanner that is the exact replica of the scanner that man in arms used um I think when he detected that cow, <laughs> that alien <laughs> life form cow, right. and it was an exact, exact uh, replica of that. And I'm like, <laughs> wow, you know, how many people figure that one out? Like 15, I mean, huge fans, you know, but I mean, right. it's easy to miss, but they deep dive so far in the lore of so much of the Motu lore. Um, yeah. yeah. It was really a wonderful series. And it's really cool to hear that, um, Teddy Biaselli, uh, reach out to you because he's such a sweet guy. Awesome. Yeah. And, um, I've, um, I've reached out to him before with fan questions and here's this executive producer at Netflix. I mean, a top brass and he, he's taken the time to answer my dumb, you know, uh-huh. <laughs> masters of the universe questions uh-huh. and, and so down to earth. And uh, so it's just awesome to hear he reached out to you. That's great. Yeah, yeah. We've been uh, we've been connected online for for a number of years. And uh, yeah, he's a super nice guy. And and just really, you know, passionate about the the brand, right? And a, and yeah. a true fan too. And I think like, what a dream to to you know that your job actually allows you to work on you know a, a, a brand that you're so you know, passionate about yourself. I mean, man, we should all be so lucky to get paid to do, to do that kind of fun work. Yeah, I can't even imagine. But that must have been his 
his holy grail. Right? Yeah. <laughs> right. And uh, I'm so glad it worked out for him. I'm so glad he got a second season, you That's know, really Masters cool. of the Universe uh, Revolution. They're so close together. I'm always like, yeah, you know, yeah. swapping names. But um, yeah. hey, but so back to your contest, back to Pig Boy. Um, you have to think, right? This contest was advertised on television. Right. And, and how many con contest entries were there? You know, thousands, tens of thousands, maybe a hundred thousand entries submitted. And just think of those odds. Um, because I entered tons of contests as a kid, I remember. <laughs> and to either win things or appear on a set or go yeah. to a film's premiere. And even as an adult, I play those lottery uh scratch offs from time to time. And the most I've won is fifty dollars, but you rich, you lucky <laughs> guy. You did it. You won it. One entry. Do you ever sit back and marvel over that? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that is uh that's that's amazing, you know. But uh I, I've I've I haven't won a thing since. So, you know, I got mine really early. Uh so that was it, you know, one and done. But no, it is. It's uh it's amazing. I remember, you know, being allowed to send in one form i remember going to toys r us and getting the getting the form um and uh, my mom was like yeah you can have you know one stamp to to mail one in i think i had like five of them or something and i wanted to mail them all and she let me mail one um and yeah so i i i, I never heard about how many they did receive but i can only imagine so it's pretty amazing yeah i mean i don't know I, 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 I'm still waiting for my turn to win something. <laughs> it's, coming. It's, coming. it's coming, but, um, and you know what, you know what, you, you were lucky twice because, um, you were lucky that this contest winner role occurred so late in production mm -hmm. when all they had left of shoot was on the set of Castle Grayskull, because otherwise you might've been just a unmemorable walk on roll, uh, like a customer in Robbie's restaurant. You remember that being served yeah. by uh, Courtney Cox, which still right. would have been cool being served right. by Courtney Cox. But instead they create um, Matashai, mm -hmm. uh, AKA yeah. Pig Boy. And, and the legend is born. Um, so you were just twice as lucky because yeah, what kid would actually get to become a monster, you know, right. with facial appliances and yeah. all of this FX. So, yeah, we didn't know uh, going into it that that's what it was going to be. We assumed, you know, simple walk on or, you know, sitting there. We had no idea until we arrived that it was going to be, as elaborate as it was that there were costume fittings that we had to go to and you know they took this mold of my face and and then you know made this elaborate mask and we had no idea that it was a, an actual character uh going into it so it was a lot of fun it was a lot of fun i i remember being like a little as a kid you know disappointed i guess that my face wasn't going to be you know on you know camera or that you wouldn't recognize me but um i mean now i look back on it and it's like you know perfect there would have been no uh you know no recollection of it you know had that right. happened so yeah no nope. cool. no one would want a uh action figure of you if you were right like, restaurant yeah. you know a customer yeah. number two or something right. you know in the background so yeah there'd be no art in art books and then uh appearances on uh revelation nothing so <laughs> yeah i mean and did your parents have any well think about that right did your parents have any trepidation because you just talk about um doing a mold of your face and if i remember that that's something where they they make you close your eyes they and maybe it's not this elaborate but they put like breathing straws in your nose, in your yep. mouth, and they pour this latex goo on your face and let it harden, yep. right? Yep. Is that what you did? Wow. Yeah, and actually now that you say that, like I can't see myself doing that now, and and uh, I don't remember uh, there being any trepidation. Um, I might have to ask my mom later, was there? Because there probably should have been. Um, 
<laughs> yeah, if, if anything's going to make you feel claustrophobic, anyone. Yeah. Like that. yeah. Yeah. For sure. For sure. But yeah, I'll have to ask my mom, hey, did you, uh, did you ever think that when they put that stuff all over my face, there might be any problems? <laughs> but yeah. I do remember when the mask itself came off. Um, I don't think I'll ever forget this as long as I live. Like my face burned. Whatever they used, whatever they used to attach that mask, when that came off, I can remember being, we filmed at night, like late at night. And I was really tired. Um, and I can remember being back in our hotel room and my face just being on fire uh from whatever adhesive they used to attach that mask and like being in absolute agony that night and, and try and like wash my face in the shower and that was i don't know what that was but i do remember that well that's what i mean i mean i yeah. i've heard about the horror stories that adults go through and to mm. see my child have to go through that yeah. um <laughs> but, <laughs> I, I don't know i don't know if i could uh well What's done is done. Were you, um, sometimes they allow you to keep the, you know, they create, I guess what they call a life mask when they do that. Mm -hmm. It hardens. Um, were you able to keep that at all? Say no. Sometimes, no. Okay. No, I don't, uh, I don't have that. I don't have any pictures of that process either. Interestingly, I've got pictures of the mask going on and all that, but I don't have any pictures of that molding process. Hmm. And you, um, met practically everybody on set right yeah. all the big names um i've seen a lot of pictures online you know anyone who googles richard sponder pig boy you're gonna see all these great pictures i assume they're all from you right um maybe there was a there was a black and white one that might have been from like a star log magazine uh it was a yeah. it was frank, frank Lagella as skeletor looking um at you in a profile shot okay is, is he kind of like leaning down yeah yeah, yeah. he's kind of like leaning in and it's just your heads yeah he was actually um i was struggling a little bit with uh so i, I struggled a bit. i mean the costume was so heavy I'll, I've, I've got the costume here if you want to see it i'll i'll uh i'll show you in a little bit but i was struggling so the, i mean i'm i'm eight years old right and and i've got this heavy multi-layered costume on and this big, heavy, yeah, 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 that one. Um, so I, anyone who's not uh, watching on YouTube, where we we found the picture and we have it. That's on awesome. I, I love that. I love that picture because he's actually coaching me in that picture. Um, he's giving me some advice. I really struggled. We did several takes, um, and I was getting it wrong, and I was getting frustrated. I, I think I said we were doing this really late at night. I was tired. I can't even describe how heavy that, you know, costume is. I can barely see through that mask. Um, there's a helmet. I, that's the only piece of the costume I don't have is the the helmet. Um, it was like glued to my head. And so, you know, I've got all this, and then I got to carry this, you know, staff that is like twice my height. And I was struggling to keep the staff straight and walk. And I was getting frustrated. They were getting frustrated. And um, so he actually came over and he was like, coaching me um, and giving me some uh, some advice on, you know, what to do. And that's a that's a moment from that. So um, I, I love that picture. Just uh, if you don't know that, you know, that's what he's doing there. You, you know, you, you kind of wonder what's going on, but he's actually helping me, which was neat. You know, I would write down every memory you have because I'd be afraid of losing it all. You know, every single detail, everything, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I can't remember, uh, you know, what I had for dinner last night. So, <laughs> so, much, so much from from that is still really so vivid, honestly, you know, and, and those pictures, they had a they had a photographer, you know, with us nonstop. And a, a lot of those pictures, um, you know, I think I think we've been back home for about a month and this big box showed up in the mail and it was two gigantic photo albums of just all the pictures they had taken from that entire time on set and uh so i recently scanned them all just to digitize them um and i've been sharing them you know here and there um but that's definitely one of my favorites you ever consider doing like a richard sponder autobiography and, uh... <laughs> it'll be about eight pages 
<laughs> but most of fans would buy it, though. Yeah, yeah. The rest of it would be uh, pretty dull. But yeah, we could do about eight pages, so maybe a maybe a, a pamphlet. <laughs> Well, I can't wait to see the costume. You pull it out whenever you're ready. Yeah, absolutely. Um, but I um, I say, um, how about we get into the movie in general? Because we also have to remember it's its 35th anniversary. So, if, um, so Rich, let's revisit it all. And um, please keep chiming in with any thoughts and, and, you know, say whatever comes to mind. Awesome. So, um I figure we'll just start with the uh, the production. You know, the production for Masters of the Universe was um, a four and a half month shoot, and you must have came in, I guess, on that last month, probably. Maybe yeah. Not even. Yeah, I remember. Um, it, well, it was November. It was November of '86, um, okay. and I know our trip had been delayed a couple times, so we had been planned to go out earlier and then we got one delay and I think there was a second delay. So we ended up going out quite a bit later than, uh, than was originally planned. You know, I wonder if they had a different spot for you at that time. I believe they did. I'm pretty sure. I'm pretty sure they did. Um, I went to uh, PowerCon 10 years ago and did a, a panel, um, with, uh, Gary Goddard was on the panel. And um, he talked about he talked about some of the delays and and uh, I believe they did have a just more of more of the traditional kind of walk on sitting in a restaurant kind of thing planned at the beginning. But it was a crazy production. You know, I, I remember um, reading at the time that the production held the record for the most sequential night shoots in a row somewhere. Uh-huh. In- in the high 50s, like 57 or 58. I mean, more than any movie in history. Oh, wow. Yeah. And um, I think I think it held the record for a long time until... I, I don't remember the movie. It was some Martin Scorsese film that finally okay. took it over. But wow. um, And I heard, you know, you were talking about being tired. Um, <laughs> everyone was tired, you know, Dolph, <laughs> Frank... Everything I think was just wearing on them because that's just so hard yeah. on the body for so long. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You know? But um, okay, so um, in that production, what else did they do? They scouted um, Eternia locations in Iceland, uh, but they ultimately filmed the Eternia outdoor scenes in Vasquez Rocks of California to save money. And uh, Man, they filmed so much in Vas- Vasquez uh, Rocks. I think they filmed uh, the Flintstones there, uh, Planet of the Apes, Star Trek, um, both movies and television. And um, oh wow, yeah, it, it was um, where in California? I don't know, but I, I think that was obviously an effort to save money. Something that was um, <laughs> that spread across the entire film. You know, I think uh, Gary Goddard even. Um, uh, flipped some of the same Vasquez rock shots in the movie that they filmed. I don't know if you oh, noticed wow. that. No. Uh, no. If you if you watch the film, I think there's a shot where it's actually just swapped over okay. and reinserted back into the edit. So it looks like it's a different part of Eternia, but yeah. uh, based on where everyone was and standing, it's just... <laughs> <laughs> it's just the same image, but you know, you're never going to catch on to it unless you see it over see, and that's over creative, and over. right? I mean, that's, that's innovation. Yeah. 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 No, there are some cost saving methods there. Absolutely. But, um, you know, and the, the castle gray skull throne room set, uh, that you were on rich. Yeah. Um, was built within two large sound stages that were not, they knocked down a wall, I believe, so they can extend it in between the two. Yeah. So what were your thoughts of being on that set? I mean, do you, I mean, one sound stage is big enough, but I'm, I'm just trying to imagine them knocking down that wall and now you're two of them, man. It's just yeah. a huge set. Yeah. You know, I remember being overwhelmed at the at the sheer size of it. I mean, it is it is as massive as it looks. Um, And uh, so I remember that being my first reaction. And then my second reaction was this doesn't look like 
Kessel Gray Skull, you know? And, yeah. Uh, you know, and, <laughs> and that was, you know, a lot of my reaction when I, that doesn't look like He-Man, that doesn't look like, you know, but uh, yeah. Where's Prince, where's Prince Adam? Right, <laughs> exactly. Yeah, like I was expecting, I think, more of like the traditional, you know, filmation look, right? That's what I knew or the toys and, and I didn't realize, you know, I, I remember being a little disappointed that it was, you know, kind of a new interpretation, right? A, a different, yeah. a different look. Um, but still, you know, overwhelmed. I mean, that 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 set is as elaborate and and gorgeous as it looks. I mean, it's it was massive. And all of those, uh, you know, on the on the sides, kind of the the pits with the stairs and everything going down there. Um, that somehow, you know, early CGI or whatever they whatever they did back then. Um, you know, I think those were matte paintings. I think. I okay. Think yeah, I don't know what they did back then, but um, yeah, I, I remember uh, those were just. I mean, those were kind of like just open, you know, open spaces. And uh, I remember seeing it on the in the film for the first time, thinking like, "Oh, how did they do that? Those were just those pits there." Um, but yeah, it was a really cool. It was a really cool set. But like off to the right, um, I remember just going right behind uh, some of those big tall statues, and that's where all the food was. Um, <laughs> it's like it's tables of food, so you just go back there and get a snack. But um, yeah, pretty amazing set. Well, the matte painting technology was really wild. And I just love, I just love what they would do before computers. And yeah. what they would do is actually paint, say you, um, you're you trying to change a horizon of trees into a space horizon. Okay. Uh, everyone is filmed on the ground level underneath the horizon line. And then a painter paints a horizon like on a piece of glass oh man of space and then they put the camera behind the glass okay and they film in real time the people doing walking around doing their acting yeah through the glass and the space is covering the trees above the horizon and that's what they would do with matte paintings that's so cool yeah yeah, and if it's like little holes in Castle Grayskull, they would just like sink it to these perfect spots, but it would have to be a lockdown camera. Okay. And um, most of the time. And um, it was really a wild technology before computers. And yeah. Uh, Amazing. And really, yeah. Actually, you know what's really cool? Um, if anyone's watching this podcast on YouTube, there's an image behind us. Um, which is a shot of the massive Grayskull set. Let me pull it up in complete view because this is, I don't know if you've ever noticed this, Rich. Okay, there it is. Um, I don't know if this is intentional or not, but the moment when Skeletor walks up its center pathway, mm -hmm. Skeletor's black cloak forms like this nasal cavity of what appears to be a large skull in this helicopter view, do you do you see uh, what I'm? Do you see what I'm seeing? There's like two yeah, eye sockets, yeah. mm -hmm. and and these stairs appear like teeth on the yep. skull. So yeah, and I'm like, is this intentional? Because this is uh, amazing. This is fantastic. I have never noticed that. Yeah, that is really cool. You know what? It took me like 15 views to notice that. <laughs> That's awesome. But, That's yeah. Really cool. Yeah. So you don't know if that was intentional or not, or no idea. Yeah, yeah. I've never no, never noticed that until until just now. I really had to look for it, but it, once you see it, it's like boom. Yeah, it just looks like there's a skull there, and it's yeah, it's, it's so creative. So love it, or a happy accident, but uh, yeah, right, right. You know, um, speaking of that uh, Castle Gray Skull, um, Gary Goddard, the um, the director was a interesting choice um, because he had never directed a movie before masters of the universe, which I bet that made him cheap and attractive in that way. But because Canon was all about cheap, right? <laughs> but uh, he got the directing gig um, on the strength of a, um, his universal studio stunt show. 
you know, it yeah. was called The Adventures of Conan, A Sword and um, Sorcery Spectacular. Um, and Gary Goddard designed that stage show back in 19... I'm going to say 1983, maybe 1984, um, which is basically just a 20 minute live action theater performance at Universal Studios Hollywood. Did you ever go to that at all? I don't remember. I don't remember going to that. The We did go to Universal Studios but while we were on that trip um, filming. Uh, they sent us everywhere. They sent us to Disneyland and, and Universal. And um, so I don't know if it was still going on then. I don't remember seeing it. It may have been over by then, but uh, that was the first time I had ever been there. I think in Hollywood, it went on to the early 90s. Okay. Like well, I might have, might have seen it. Uh, that, it, it would have been wild if you did, but, yeah. um, but you've been to those like theme parks um stage shows before right those stunts Absolutely. yeah the indiana jones and star wars oh, yeah. yeah yeah the indiana jones one i remember that one so good <laughs> well you know it always felt to me i'll be curious what you think um that gary goddard brought a lot of that conan live show sensibility and ported it into the masters of the universe film yeah, including the building of this large Grayskull stage, you know, to contain so many of the scenes and elements, and even was supposed to contain what that end battle between He Man and Skeletor that they never filmed because they ran out of money and they shut down production. Um, I mean, I could even visualize a a studio audience in there in a way. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, and and you know what, um. I just think the a lot of that movie had that sort of, um, you know, this not just the set, but the way it was filmed. Um, you can see that stage theater DNA vibe. Yeah, yeah um, definitely. I think I think it's there in the I think it's there in the in the costume stuff even. You know, like so I'll show you a couple of these pieces here, but I remember um, this. This being one of the first things they they fit on me, and it was this burlap dress. And I don't wow. uh, I don't know if, I don't know if you can see that too well, but uh, it's just it's a it's a dress. It's an actual dress. And I remember uh, this was the first first thing I tried on. And then you know to the inside of the dress they sewed these uh, I don't know what kind of fabric that it is, but they made the sort of scaly lizardy fabric and the arms and these, you know, these patches that they put on here, but they kind of pieced, they really pieced all this together, you know, from all these different pieces. And it has a very, you know, theater, theater kind of vibe. This was my favorite. I always loved, I always loved this piece. It was the, it was the hooded cloak. Wow. Uh, which I just thought, I thought this was the coolest thing. Um, and, I can't, uh, I can't yeah. believe they gave that to you. I mean, yeah, it was uh, it was another surprise. I asked for it. Um, I asked if I could have it, and I was told no. Uh, that they kind of break these things down and they reuse pieces for you know other things and um, yeah. And uh, this was like the little sash sash that I wore around the waist. I mean, there was a ton of a ton of wow. detail. Um, but yeah, I was told no, I couldn't have it. And then, um, it was like maybe a month after we got back, another big boxes, boxes showed up. Like it was exciting for weeks after we got home, boxes of stuff would show up. Um, you know, I got, a, a box like with the, with the photo albums of all the pictures. I got a box with toys, like kids dream come true. They gave me a list of every Masters of the Universe toy ever made at that point, told me to check off the ones that I had, and everything that I didn't have, they sent me, which was amazing. That box showed up. Um, tubes of movie posters showed up. 
um, you know, all the different versions of the, the posters. And then I think the last box to show up was the costume. And uh, I remember being just amazed because I, uh, I had asked, you know, and had been told no. And the only piece I don't have is the helmet. And uh, so I did, I wore it for Halloween the next year. Now by that point, like it was, I guess, 11 months later and uh, I could barely squeeze into it, but I did wear it. I did wear it for Halloween the following year. Oh no. Well, I mean, it's so cool that you did, but then like the adult me is saying, that's worth so much money, Rich. Yeah. <laughs> what, are you, what are you doing taking it outside? <laughs> you probably <laughs> Eating chocolate as a kid, wiping your hands on the costume. Well, I'm kind of a. Ama- I mean, I, I I guess probably it's good. My 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 parents are a little nostalgic, but it's kind of amazing that like we didn't just like throw it out. You know, I mean, a long a long time went by without any any discussion of of this. I mean, it was always something. You know, it was an exciting thing we had as a family, but. You know, there was no, there was no internet, there was no social media, there were no DVDs even, right? I mean, the first time, the first time I really thought much about the movie since, you know, get, since, since it came out was um, when the DVD release, the first DVD release came out and they had the, uh, you know, director's commentary on the DVD. And I thought, oh, do you think, you think he'll talk about me, you know, when, when we, Get to that section and and sure enough you know oh did he yeah it got its commentary right and that was the first time i don't even remember when that was but you know dvds right and and so you know not much there a long time went without any discussion of this right and then with you know the the you know advent of social media and and the internet right it kind of yeah. became a way to connect with fans and and people remembered stuff and a way to share um and it's turned into a you know a thing again but there was a really long period of time without any you know any discussion about it and it's amazing all the things that you got because i mean i'm sure that wasn't a condition of the contest you know yeah. that you would get the costume or these posters or all of these extra goodies so yeah. it just seems like they went the extra mile um to yeah um, to, to, to just make this a wonderful experience for you, which is just so cool. It know? was, it was, we were, we were treated like, I mean, it was, it was like nothing we had ever seen. I mean, I remember getting there the first night and, you know, Mattel executives taking my family out to this, you know, fancy restaurant in LA, um, on our first night. And I remember ordering, I don't know why I remember this. I remember ordering duck. And uh, seeing duck on the menu, and I was like, "You can eat a duck, uh, you know? I'll, yeah, I want to eat a duck." So order That's, a duck. You that know? is so strange for a kid to do that, you know. <laughs> yeah, and, you are uh, you are adventurous. <laughs> <laughs> and my my sister, who was three, who was three years younger than me, um, a uh, one of the servers was actually carrying a tray of glasses of ice water and dumped it, tripped and dumped it on my sister. Oh, yeah. On our first night there and you know the time time difference we were we were all a bit of a mess um that night but we were treated like uh like gold i mean we were we were put up in this um it was the the top floor suite of a hotel in beverly hills called the westwood marquee i forget what it is now it's it's another kind of famous beverly hills hotel but we had this you know suite that was bigger than our house with you know i remember telephones in the bathroom i thought that was cool but um yeah we had a limo driver you know at our wow. beck and call assigned to us whenever we wanted to go anywhere he was waiting downstairs they sent us to disneyland to you know universal um anywhere we wanted to go um it was amazing yeah they treated us really well so did this ever give you like the acting bug did you yeah. ever it did okay absolutely yeah and i remember um there was a movie there was they were advertising um it was some it was a barbara hershey movie the next year filming in chicago and uh i remember talking to my dad about you know taking me to audition and uh, he was totally supportive um and i ended up not wanting to do i'm i'm 
totally an introvert. I always have been like, I'm a pretty shy guy. And uh, I was like, yeah, no, let's, let's not do that. Um, but initially afterward, for sure, wanted to do that. Yeah, I think, I think that would be something I would want to explore. Like, wow, that was easy. You know? <laughs> yeah. But um, unfortunately, a Barbara Hershey movie. Uh, <laughs> if anybody <laughs> knows who that is, right? <laughs> <laughs> Well, um, so uh, back on that, um, you know, that whole uh, theater DNA, and uh, I love that costume. Thank you for showing that. Yeah. Um, uh, you know, Gary had also brought over um, two actors from that Conan um, stunt show. Um, Anthony, uh, who played Blade, mm -hmm. um, was in that stunt show, and uh, Robert Towers as Karg. And especially with Karg, um, I saw a lot of. Um, for lack of a better word, uh, overacting, you know, this abundance of uh, spinning and over animated gestures, you know, that yeah. that look grand on stage uh, to an audience sitting at a distance, but appears sometimes unnatural and hamming it up, mm. you know, um, uh, for a movie, you know, and um, something like that, you know, like it or hate it. Uh, a traditional director wouldn't have brought to a picture like this. Yeah. You know? Yeah. It is a, it is a love or hate relationship that people have with the movie for a lot of those reasons. You know, you do either. I, I don't, I don't ever talk to anyone who's like, eh. I mean, there is, there is passion <laughs> one way or another about the movie. Um, and and for for a lot of those you know a lot of those reasons but uh yeah i remember my my very favorite uh favorite forever uh person that i met on that set was meg foster um just like absolutely amazing and evil lynn was always my favorite character i was, I was gonna ask you what was your favorite wow. yeah to, to this day i mean I, I still, I still follow the, you know, I follow the brand and I see what's going on and, and watch the shows. And, um, you know, I don't, I don't collect the way that I used to and the way that a lot of people do. Um, but there are certain characters that no matter what I will pick, I will pick it up when I'm out and Evelyn is, you know, the one. So I have, I have every version of Evelyn, uh, you know, ever. And, um, I remember meeting her and she was just, amazing and she was so gracious to uh to me and my family and there's some really cool candid pictures uh with her and us backstage you know showing off her costume and and it was just um it was really cool and what what really got me to powercon 10 years ago um was when they told me that she was going to be on the panel and uh i got to sit next to her and you know we, we were able to chat beforehand and of course you know she didn't she didn't remember me but i had and fig i figured she wouldn't so i had brought some of those pictures with um so that i could show her hey this is me and um it was just it was absolutely amazing but but she was just i remember her being so kind and so sweet to my family and I remember my dad uh, being a bit enamored. Um, <laughs> your your yeah. poor mom. <laughs> but yeah, that was pretty magical. And she was in costume uh, the times that I that I did see her, and so that was even better because you know here's my my very favorite character come to life. And if there was any interpretation of any character that I thought was just really amazing, it was her interpretation. I know Meg Foster was just such great uh, casting, and I don't know um, what's a good adjective to use. It's not the best actor adjective, but she had such a wispy, I don't know, sultry voice, and those eyes, those pale, pale blue eyes, yeah, that make her so distinctive. Yep. And it requires no further convincing that there's something um, magical deep inside her, right? That yeah. she has been in touch with sorcery other than those eyes. And right. it, it was just wonderful casting. And, um, you know, her and um, Frank, right? Yeah. yeah. 
Now, Frank, <laughs> Frank, speaking of hamming it up, by the way, um, Frank um, Lagella as Skeletor, you know, when I was young, um, I didn't like, you know, the way he looked. Oh, you know? really? Yeah, instead of um, eye sockets, we got those visible eyes. And, yeah. And that's so very fake looking nose cavities, you know, that look painted <laughs> on the little mesh. And um, this is me as a child, you know. Right. And uh, he sometimes struck me as this like strange ghost face, mm -hmm. you know, and it was like nowhere near as cool as um, Filmation Skeletor or, or yeah. even my my vintage figure that I had. But um, and as a kid, I'm hearing alpha and the omega and the death and the rebirth and i'm wondering what the heck is he talking about <laughs> wow. you know when is skeletor going to call someone you bumbling pope you know <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> yeah his, yeah he was he was scary he was really evil he had this deep voice he wasn't yellow and he, that, that was that was my problem it's like why Evil and why isn't she yellow, right? And uh, why isn't he? Why isn't his face yellow? Um, yeah, I I really did like both of the interpretations of them. Um, actually, I, I you know once I got once I got used to it, um, I I liked them. I really did. Uh, I didn't have didn't have a problem with with the two of them. But um, yeah, it was just it was so it was so different. Um, oh, I mean, all of it was, but. You know, looking back at it now, too, I mean, you see sort of the romantic connection, too, between yeah. the two of them, right? Which, I mean, we never would have seen anything like that, you know, portrayed in the in the cartoons. But you see, I mean, they were both, I, I think they both did a great job with those characters. I mean, you see this vulnerability in, in Evil Lynn, right, where she's clearly trying to impress him, right, and, and please him. And you see this... Uh, sometimes maybe a little bit of affection in him right i mean there was there was some real depth i thought between the two of them yeah absolutely i love that now let yeah. me just bounce i, I want to touch on that but i want to go back before people roast me in the comments i want to say that um when i grew older though um, <laughs> i and this is honest truth um i appreciated this grandiose skeletor you know yeah and I appreciated the compromise in design. Um, enough uh, rigid appliances on his face to look like um, bone, but enough soft facial pliable appliances to let Frank's performance shine through. So he yeah. can stay, say cool stuff like, where is your strength? You know, when has it gone? I can't do a Skeletor, but um, <laughs> he just chewed yeah. He just chewed up the scenery and, yeah. and now 35 years later, the thing that I hated, I love the most, you mm -hmm. know, I, I, I love, I mean, I love Evil Lynn like you too, but yeah, Frank, every time Frank Lagella is on the screen, I just, I eat it up. I, I just can't wait for him to be more on it. Um, and now back to where you went before, which I totally agree with you is, um, I also liked uh, the intimate moments yeah. seen between Skeletor and Evil Lynn mm -hmm. and uh, where she kneels before him and Skeletor actually strokes her face. Yeah. And he softly talks to her about how he depends on her. Mm -hmm. And then when you hear the door open, you know, Evil Lynn quickly gets up and they refer to the uh, status quo. So I love them depicting what so many fans felt Skeletor and Evelyn's um, sometimes toxic relationship um, starting in the filmation series really was, you know, mm -hmm. and I, I didn't catch that on as a kid, but I appreciate that Yeah, as an adult. And we were talking about revelation and they actually took that to the next level, but we saw that toxic relationship because mm -hmm. he was so sweet and dare I say tender to mm -hmm. her. In that quiet moment, but then the next thing, when the uh, mercenaries um, fail, right? Yeah. And, and um, he goes ahead and kills my favorite mercenary. We'll get there. Uh, uh, <laughs> he uh, next thing you know, he's sending her 
you know, it, yeah. into, into jeopardy. So you feel this, this, this unhealthy relationship. And yeah. it, there's a deeper subtext even to this film that I didn't see as a child, but I see it as an adult and I love it. You know? Yeah, they really, I mean, they, they take it to, you know, a, a different place. I mean, a lot of it, a lot of it is campy, you know, there's a yeah, lot, yeah. there's a lot of over, overacting and, and, uh, you know, some cheap, cheap one-liners, but I mean, there is some real depth in those moments. And I, yeah, I think it's, I think it's great. Um, I never saw either of them out of costume. So I didn't know, I hadn't seen Frank Langella in anything else. I knew he was Dracula. Uh, I wasn't allowed to watch that. Um, I never, I had never seen him in anything else. Uh, and so it wasn't until the movie Dave came out. I don't know if you remember that movie. It's uh, Kevin um, Kline and Kevin Scott Weaver. He, he's like a, he impersonates the president and he looks so much like him. They bring him in to play the, or actually be the president when the president has like a stroke or something. I remember and, that. Uh, Frank Langella, I think he plays the secretary of state maybe or something in that movie. Kind of, a, again, sort of an evil guy. Um, and that was the first time I ever saw him out of costume in anything else. I couldn't believe what he actually looked like. I think that movie was 96 or 97 or something like that. But yeah, like 10 years later, um, first time I ever knew what he looked like out of costume. You know, I didn't know either when that film came out. And I think the first time I saw him was this, not a very good movie. It's called um, Junior, starring Arnold Schwarzenegger, where he okay. becomes the first pregnant man. I saw that. <laughs> you saw that? Okay. I see that. And then Frank was this doctor that wanted the technology to make money and was suspecting that Arnold was actually pregnant. And again, he's the villain, right? <laughs> you yeah, know? Right. He, he's typecast as a villain. And um, I think, I don't know, I was reading a magazine and, you know, I saw his name, Frank Lagella, and I saw the picture and I'm like, what? That's Skeletor? <laughs> what? And uh, yeah, yeah. So that was quite, yeah. yeah. Just as a kid, who would know? Who would I know? Think, uh, I think the next time I saw him, and uh, I, I hesitate to say this because I might get this, I might get this wrong and, and get myself in trouble. But I'm pretty sure. Oh, uh, maybe I shouldn't. I'm pretty sure he was in this really terrible movie called Body of Evidence with. It was like a basic instinct knockoff with Willem Dafoe and Madonna. Kathleen Turner? Oh, Madonna. Madonna. Oh, 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 I remember that film. Oh. Awful. And and I'm pretty sure, all right, I, I'll apologize in advance if I'm wrong, but I, I rem and I, I haven't thought about this in years now that we're talking about his other movies. I remember seeing him in that being like, all right, that's disgusting. And like, I'm super disappointed that you did this horrendous movie. Um, but yeah, I'm pretty sure he's in that too. Ugh, bad. I'm gonna I'm gonna one up you, um, so you don't feel bad. Okay. <laughs> I had the same exact experience with Frank Lagella, but it was with the actress who was in Risky Business, opposite Tom Cruise, Rebecca oh. De Mornay. Could that be right? I'm not sure. Oh, yeah. And yeah. it was something like God created women, or and God created women, and it was a very soft core. Um, I guess skin flick, they would call okay. him back in the day. Yeah. And he was in it. And I'm like, Frank, you're in this. <laughs> you know, like, what are you doing? He's so good. Like, what are you doing? <laughs> yeah. And uh yeah, he was he was on a pool table. You know what? I'm not even gonna go there. But he uh he's a Tony Award winner. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, I know. I so know. it's fu funny, you and I had similar experiences, but with different films. But yeah. uh, why? Why did you do this? <laughs> <laughs> but you know what he'll he'll always still be um skeletor for me and um for sure you know um back on um uh, i guess the rest of the cast uh we might as well go through them real quick uh, not so they feel left out um chelsea field i liked as tila and there was john cypher as man at arms mm -hmm. and um i was a really big fan of chelsea um John, I don't know. He felt a little off. I thought as a child, perhaps he should be a little bit, uh, excuse me, I can't speak, a bit 
little more athletic. You know, everyone in Masters in the Universe is tough. Right. Y- you know, and it felt uh, like Tila could hold her own and it felt like yeah. uh, He Man could hold his own. But um, I don't know. With John, um, but he's a great actor. He was in this show called um, Hill Street Blues. And, oh, yeah, that's right. That's right. Yeah, he was yeah. in a long, long time and he was great. But uh, so, Man in Arms, I like him, but I wasn't sure about. Um, Oh, but we should talk about He-Man himself, huh? So what about He-Man himself? Uh, what what did you think of the great Ivan, I will break you, you know, Dra- <laughs> Drago, uh, Dolph Lundgren in the uh, role of He-Man? Hey, I, remember, uh, I remember meeting him for the first time. Um, it was uh, like the first day we arrived um, on set, like days and days before we did filming and we were in this office area and uh, he came in and uh, he was in this, uh, I don't know, these like short gym shorts and like a, a zip up hoodie or something. There's pictures from that, from that moment. And that's the picture where my mom is oogling him, which is hilarious. <laughs> uh, my dad took the picture and it's so funny because he, he caught my mom in a, in a really funny moment, but um, I remember thinking like, yeah, that's, that's He-Man for sure. Like he had, he had the look, uh, for sure. And he was super nice. Like, again, really, really nice. Everybody, everybody there was, was just incredible. Um, and saw him, we saw him a number of times, um, you know, before the actual, uh, before the actual night of, of filming and, uh, yeah, he was great. He was great. Yeah. I think he was, um, six foot four. Four, six foot five, I believe. But um, yeah, I, I I agree with you, Rich. I mean, this might be against uh, popular opinion, but I thought he was perfect for the role. I mean, he had a he had a great charm about him and smile, you know. And I was never distracted by his accent, which is not uh, it's not Russian; it's Scandinavian. You know, a lot of people think it's a Russian accent, I guess, from the Rocky IV movie. Yeah. I see that mistake made all the time, but he's Scandinavian. And I think he's a chemist, too. He's an accomplished. Yeah, he's chemist. like brilliant. He's, he's yeah, yeah, he absolutely is. Yeah. Um, I don't know if the accent bothered me or not. Um, I don't think so. Um, yeah, I, I he he looked the part, right? I mean, he absolutely looked the part. And I think. I think looking the part with He-Man is as important as, you know, whatever else you do. Um, And he absolutely looks the part. Well, for me also, um, being a Filmation child and loving Filmation, loving that continuity that goes into Revelation, it's a very smiley He-Man. It's a very, it's a very happy He-Man versus the vintage, the vintage toy that we're familiar with, with the angry face, you know, or some of the, some of the other shows where everyone's so angry and he man's right. you know, but in filmation, he, he had a smile about him and, and I just loved Dolph's smile. And um, yeah, and regarding that accent, I mean, I recently watched promotional interviews um, that were recorded back in 1987. And, you know, I, they were saying, you know, they gave Dolph three chances in the film, you know, to to record his accent, uh, to record his dialogue um, with the least amount of accent possible. And I've heard all these stories, but as I'm watching these interviews, I didn't hear an accent that was unintelligible at all. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's less thicker than stars like Arnold Schwarzenegger and sure. um, the muscles from Brussels, you know, Jean-Claude Van Damme. And uh, it it wasn't distracting at yeah. all. No, no, no. He did he did a great job. It, yeah. And uh, yeah, I I remember seeing the film and 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 being disappointed overall and just sort of the the lack of um, you know lack of ties to you know the original story. Like it 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 really bothered me that there was no transformation scene that there was no prince adam that i mean that that's a big deal right like and 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 i get it right there were a lot of there were a lot of challenges with the with the film and everything but to me that was i think the biggest miss um i mean i'm sure a lot of people did but like i would you know i would i would 
that's what I would do. You know, I'd take my swords outside, right? And I would I'd play that. I mean, that was like the every every character transforming from their secret identity into their, you know, superhero self is the iconic moment in like every storyline like this, right? So and and his transformation is is truly, I think, one of the greatest. And so to not have that was a bummer, but you kind of get a little bit of it at the end, right? You have a moment, which which is somewhat redeeming. Um, but uh, but other than that, I thought I thought he did a really nice job. I agree. Um, I, you are, you and I are simpatico about that. Um, I really needed that transformation. I needed yeah. that Prince Adam. I needed that dynamic. But but you know, I don't. Obviously, neither of us puts that on Dolph the Man, right? No. Um, and um, and if the movie failed critically and if the movie failed financially, I don't put any of this on uh, Dolph Lundgren's uh, shoulders, you know? No, and, um, no, not at all. Yeah. And and what it's become now is, you know, I mean, it it's iconic in, in a lot of ways. I mean, I talk to people and there is nobody who hasn't seen it. There's nobody who, uh, you know, doesn't watch it when it's on. I mean, you, it's, it's, um, everybody has seen it. So it's really, you know, whatever happened to it when it first came out, it's become something really special. Again, whether you love it or hate it, you can't, you can't deny that it has really become something very special. Yeah. Yeah. Did you like the, um, the red cape on He-Man? Or you ever see that uh, cartoon Incredibles, I think, where it's like no capes and <laughs> it shows all these superheroes meeting their demise, you know? Yeah, I mean, I, I always, I always like a cape. I don't, yeah, I don't really have a problem with a cape on anybody, but uh, yeah, I, I don't remember uh, having a problem with that. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So um, also in casting, uh, real quick, uh, Billy Barty, right, as Gwildor. Yeah. Um, how can anyone not like him? And yeah. you know what? I think he was, I mean, th there was some, I remember some mild annoyance that, um, you know, Gwildor was used as a cheaper way to replace Orko because you don't have to manage a character that flies around all the time. Yeah, but I thought both um, Billy and Gildor was fantastic. Oh yeah, and, and he was, I think, seventy three at the time. Yeah, I mean, what a machine to wear all those appliances and to be up all those nights, and yeah. it's incredible. Yeah. And didn't you have a good experience with him? I heard I had an amazing experience with him that sadly there are no photos of. Um, I've got photos of everything, and I. I don't know where our photographer was at that moment, but um, no, I really regret that there are no photos of that. I remember being in his uh, in his trailer with him, my sister and I being in there. I don't remember my parents being there. They must have been like right outside or something, but sitting sitting in there having a, a conversation with him in full costume, full makeup um, and him, you know, telling us about the hours and hours of, you know, sitting there, you know, getting ready. And um, he was just just a an absolute delight he just radiated kindness and you know it was it was fun to it was fun to see these people later on like you know a few years later uh you know he he shows up in an episode of the golden girls of all things right there's a there's a uh really a, yeah there's a dream sequence and he uh he shows up in the golden girls like I remember watching the Cosby show and Meg Foster was, uh, you know, one of Claire Huxtable's friends on one episode of the Cosby show and then seeing, you know, Courtney Cox show up on family ties. And then of course, yeah. Fred. it would be like, it was amazing to see these people that I had met and, and interacted with, you know, show up kind of randomly on, on shows and things. But um, I, I so wish there were pictures with him because uh, he was so cool. And then to, to learn years later, I didn't even know he was in the wizard of Oz and like, I mean, amazing to, to be in the presence of that someone and to just be such kindness. 
isn't that great? Yeah. I mean, you know, when, when you have these like heroes and he was definitely uh, so beloved, you know, and when, when they treat you with such kindness and compassion and you, you feel like this stardom never gets to their head, mm -hmm. um, it just makes you appreciate these more, you know, yeah. because I've met a couple celebrities that were the exact opposite of that. Mm -hmm. I'll keep their names out. Um, and um, so when you come across something like that, it's just so wonderful to hear, you know, yeah. and, and the fact that he, because he, he, he's big. I mean, Billy was, you know, a legend, you know, yeah. and absolutely so sad that I don't remember when he passed away. Um, hmm. Yeah. I remember hearing about it, but can't remember when yeah. it was. Yeah. But um, ah, he was great. Um, we have anyone left? Oh, Christina Pickles um, as the sorceress. And um, yeah, that was another one. Her showing up years later as uh, Monica and Ross's mom on Friends, right? Like, oh, uh, you're right. Yeah. You're right. Yeah. I would see these, you know, I'd see these people show up later on. And, and uh, yeah, it's, it was cool. You know, I, I, I liked her as the sorceress, sort of. I mean, yeah. um, Again, it, it's hard for an actor to stand still, stuck in a imaginary circle, right. force field for almost an entire film, and yeah. be under some sort of power draining trance. Yeah, you know? yeah. And really, really give an amazing performance. Um, but uh, she was good. I was just not a big fan of her redesign. That was the thing for me. So you know, I mentioned the certain you know characters that no matter how many times they reproduce them, I will go buy the, the latest one. That's another one for me. I always loved the sorceress and I did not like that. I was, that was her, her costume and Tila, I think were my, my two least favorite interpretations out of, out of all of them, I've got to say, but uh, yeah, I, I thought it was elaborate and beautiful and, but it wasn't the sorceress for me. Yeah. With Tila's, I think I could sort of, um, dismiss as she was the daughter of man at arms and captain of the guard. And they're, they're trying to maintain this aesthetic. I agree with you. I prefer the classic, you know, costuming yeah. Yeah. But with, the, with the sorceress. I was just wondering what they were doing. I mean, she had this like chandelier on her head, upside right. down chandelier yeah. and she was sparkly. You yeah. Know? <laughs> that one but, seems like it would have been an easy one to, to do something with, you know, wings and feathers. Yeah. I mean, that one seems, I don't know, but I mean, like I said, beautiful. And, and I did like, I like how they aged her. I thought that was a cool kind of, you know, element of the, the storyline and, and, you know, how he would drain the power from her. And, and uh, I thought that was cool. It just wasn't the sorceress. It's sometimes I don't understand when they make changes just for the sake of changes. Mm -hmm. Right. You could say that of the sorceress um, costume or even Castle Grayskull itself. Yeah. You know, where uh, Masters of the Universe, um, as you know, is this great combination of um, uh, sorcery and technology. But Castle Grayskull was always this um, more sorcery, right? It was the home of sorcery, not much technology. Right. And as you were, I think you were touching on before, um, they changed this, you know, and um, I think some of this was to have this big elaborate set because that's what um, Gary knew. But um, yeah, sometimes I still don't, even though I, I've grown to love all of it, um, yeah. I just don't understand what, you know, if something's not broken, don't fix it. As yeah. They say. yeah, yeah, it's it's gorgeous. Like you can't deny how beautiful it is and it's it's overwhelmingly beautiful um it just at the time really didn't didn't resonate with me you know and and yeah. uh i don't know the movie was probably two years too late right because things yeah. were starting to things were starting to fade i mean even if you look at kind of the toys that came out you know around the same time um you know i, I know people you know clamor for the you know eternia playset, right that they yeah. came out and and uh but that's got such a different look and feel, right? Things were, it was kind of evolving more into this spacey looking 
stuff and and some of the later figures you know i remember i think it's extendar that i loved right but but had kind of that you know almost more modern space looking and and i think the movie the movie picks up on some of that with with certain things and and uh i don't know the toy line was kind of evolving too so i i didn't wonder if you know maybe the movie was you know an attempt to to take the brand in a different direction even i don't know um but but the movie was probably two years too late. Yeah, that's fair. You know, and you're talking about um, the later toys. I mean, I was a lover of the original ones, which I got, um, including Castle Grave Skull and the original um, henchmen. And and um, that that was a stickler for me too, because um, you know, when I'm getting a Masters of the Universe film, right, I'm expecting uh, Merman and Beastman yeah. and Trapjaw, you know, and right. uh, and then, uh, you know, here we get these henchmen and we get Beastman. Um, yeah. But then we get like, who are these guys? Right. <laughs> you know, who's this card guy and, and, and Blade and, and yeah. this, and Sorod, you know, and and why are there stormtroopers everywhere? <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, yeah, yeah, that I could deal with, except uh, <laughs> they were robots. But I think I'd still be okay if I got those traditional villains. And yeah. um, right, no, totally, totally, because you had like your, you could almost equate them with kind of like your horde troopers, right? That sort yeah. of thing, um, which totally, totally works, but. Yeah, I remember. I remember thinking, "Who are who are these guys?" Um, you know, didn't didn't love uh, Karg. You know that he did nothing for me. Um, didn't care for the character of Blade, but absolutely had a blast meeting him and talking with him. And there's some really cool, candid pictures that we got with him too. Uh, so had a blast there. But the one that I felt like worked in every way and was very true to masters of the universe was sarad like it worked yes. if they were going to create a new henchman for this movie like he fit perfectly reminded me of like a snake man kind of you know thing going on it was he was perfect Rich, we're two peas in the pod. I mean, I'm I'm the same way. Out of Karg, out of Blade, out of Beastman, I'm in Sarod. Um, oh, he was played by an interesting actor. Um, his name was Pons. I don't remember his last name. Pons Mar. Pons Mar. Yes, uh, yes. Uh, um, but Sarod, I found the most visually interesting, and wish he wasn't the one killed by Skeletor. You I know. know. He, he had this great um frog-like throat that expanded when he was breathing and uh so neat moves, you know the way he moves and and like it's yeah it's it's great it's great yeah of all the of all the ones to destroy um but yeah yeah i was like why couldn't you kill you know karg instead because <laughs> You know, the audience wouldn't have to stare any longer at this huge bouffant of hair. Right. I mean, right. what what is up with that hair, Rich? I mean, it's like <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. This That's lizard. Probably guy. why he never he, they never, you know, turned him into a, a figure. You know, Blade Blade got a figure. Well, uh, actually, actually, I'm sorry. I think Card did get a figure. Did he get a figure on. back then or or more? No. Oh, not back then. You're right. Yeah, right. yeah. I don't think he got one back then. Um, yeah. Wildor got a figure. Blade got a figure, and uh, Sorad got a figure. And Sorad, um, uh, he shot sparks out of his mouth. You remember that? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that would probably never fly today, <laughs> but uh, that was pretty cool. But yeah, I don't think they made a. They didn't. I don't think they made a card back then. But I know. I know. There's a. There's a more recent one. But, yes yeah i'm sorry yeah. that's that's the one i was referring to super seven i think they made four they made yes. man dark des uh despo am i pronouncing that right despot skeletor i'm not sure i really don't know um god skeletor and then yeah. Yeah. yeah i didn't get those and i regret that i'm gonna have to hit ebay one of these days and and, and get those i should have there i should have grabbed those they're pricey now i yeah. um i have uh both Skeletors that I didn't pick up. They're actually not here, but okay. um, but now I think there's something like 
especially the Skeletors. I think they go upwards towards $150. Okay. Yeah. 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 yeah it's pretty pricey, but, um, Man, I tell you, it's funny you mentioned the sparks. I had so many toys that had sparks <laughs> and created flames, like you know, cap, oh, yeah. cap cap guns back then, and and stuff that you would never give a kid now. <laughs> no, it's amazing that we're sitting here, you know, able to talk about it with all the stuff we had growing up. <laughs> right, right, and, and 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 all the guns, and none of these guns. If uh, for anyone who's younger than us. None of these guns, I mean, these were realistic plastic guns um, that would never have like this orange warning kind of nozzle that's, you know, supposed to warn cops that this is not real. I mean, this right. stuff was realistic that yeah. eight and nine year olds were playing with. And yeah. it was quite a different time. <laughs> we also had candy cigarettes too, right? Yeah. Yeah. We'd buy a pack. <laughs> <laughs> we'd sit there and start pretending we're smoking. Yep. Oh, I would get those um, <laughs> rich at my school store. And, oh, right, yeah. and right next to them, no joke, audience, I would buy the um, amputated feet of rabbits. They oh, called them yes, rabbits. I had those, the keychains, right? The keychains. They called them rabbit feet. Yeah. They were real feet from rabbits they had the little nails from them i know i'm sorry this sounds macabre but this was this was the time back then that everyone had a rabbit's foot and they would dye the fur like different colors i had a, i had like a, a royal blue one and it's disgusting i i i mean i can't i can't even I can't even believe we carried those around like right i mean and and raccoon tails was another thing like i it mortifies me now to think about it, but uh, yeah, that was a thing. And, and they had the nails on them still. Uh, I know, yeah, I know. Cool. Yeah. And we just didn't realize, you know, and uh, yeah. we're all ashamed of it now, but it was just part of the culture back then. Yeah. And, uh, and it was sold in schools. We had school stores and they sold these things. So um, yeah, it was just a different world back then. And we've definitely improved in a lot of areas, oh, I would sure. say, you know? Yeah. But um, I guess the last thing that we haven't even touched upon was just the actual um, story. Um, you know, uh, it was kind of interesting for Masters of the Universe that um, we started this, this story with uh, Skeletor on top. You know, he's conquered. He's won. It begins, <laughs> the, the film actually begins with Eternia in death and destruction. Yeah. And you could even catch some um, blood splatters in the beginning on the uh, Vasquez rock um, set. And it's interesting that we never get to see Eternia in its original state. You know, mm -hmm. I guess I guess other than Skeletor looking out um, of the eye of Grayskull, then cut to credits. Uh, we start with Eternia in complete ruin, you know, and um I don't know for for fans maybe presenting Eternia this way works I think but maybe for people first dipping their toes into the franchise with no familiar familiarity of um, Eternia or its monarchy or the workings of Castle Grayskull I wonder if the lack of setup except that brief narration um, was confusing for new viewers you know I wonder if all things were perfect a story like this would have been better suited for a a sweet sequel or like a middle film of a trilogy. Yeah, definitely. Um, I think it would have totally worked as a second film um, because I, I want to see how it happened. I mean, they give you a little bit of background, but like yeah. that would be, that would be something to see. Like how, how does that, how does it happen? Right. And, and I could see a first film ending that way. Right. And, and then this one kind of, picking up um yeah the story is the, the story is interesting it's definitely it's definitely dark right and and uh i don't know things things have things have since gotten a lot darker but yeah being kind of the filmation kid that i was too like uh i don't know it's 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 happy there's lots of bright colors you know and and there's a lot of uh uh just happy moments and flowers and 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 uh 
yeah, it's 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 a dark Eternia for sure. Yeah. yeah, yeah, and and or what do they call it? Also, a um, they positioned it in a um, oh uh, reverse Wizard of Oz, right? Mm -hmm. um, where uh, the audience starts this time in Oz, and then it's transported to the real world, you know? Right. And then we get some of that um, fish out of water comedy, like uh, Tila eating ribs and not right. realizing it's meat. Yeah. How yeah. does that happen? Anyway? <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, uh, Eter attorney and meat can't be, or I don't know, any different. I guess they're all vegetarians. How uh, yeah, it's not, it sounds like that, yeah. But yeah, yeah, I don't know. Yeah, there's some there's some moments where it's like, Okay. You know, but... Or the heroes making uh, contact with a cow. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh. And Gwild <laughs> Gwildor's trying to, you know, have a discussion. I think with this thing, yeah. and uh, yeah, and I think I think they had farm animals, similar farm animals on uh, Eternia. Yeah. No, it, there's some there's some weird moments for sure, right? Um, yeah. I didn't, I didn't love the idea, the whole idea of them coming to Earth. Yeah. Um, yeah, I just I don't know. Um yeah, I didn't 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 love that. I don't want to see those I don't want to see those characters interacting with you know, your your normal earth people. They did some fun stuff and and uh it was cool, but I I didn't love the whole idea of them coming to earth. I was, you know, uh I think we we heard or we were told the reason behind that was for cost saving uh measures. Yeah. But the more I think about it through all these night shoots and stuff um, and what they did in Vasquez Rocks, I always wondered, could they have done a whole film on Eternia? Look, even when they land in Earth and they're in that little swamp area, but it's an Earth swamp, right? And they see the cow and there's all this lush green and foliage. It still looks to me like it could be Eternia. Sure. And it, Eternia had a lot of similar landscapes as um as Earth does, so yeah. I was just yeah, just like Vasquez Rocks, right? So I was wondering why couldn't they have done this? Um, yeah, you know, and and f had a film mostly set in Eternia, you know, yeah. and, and still been a low budget film. I don't know. Yeah, yeah, because I think you know, there's there's a lot of places they could have gone on Eternia. I mean, they were always they were always going to you know different different places, right? To to either save somebody or you know find some special gemstone or something right so there there could have yeah. been all kinds of opportunities to 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 do something like that um but i mean then you wouldn't have your you know lubic and you know those uh those moments right so um, <sighs> I love Lubick, by the way. Uh, we should have mentioned them. I mean, uh, I don't mind Courtney Cox and Robert McNeil um, as Julie and Kevin. Um, I've never found those characters very compelling, but they did fine in their roles, you know. But Detective Lubick, <laughs> James Tolkien, right? Um, yeah. 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 Talk about an iconic, like, 80s movie face, right? Like Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the only thing the only thing that would have been better would would have been like if he had been the principal at the high school because like he, he was always the mean principal guy right they could but no it was it was good. Well, actually i never met him uh on the set i didn't meet him until years later uh at a convention here uh one of the wizard world conventions um in chicago here i actually met him uh finally um, and took a picture with him, but never met him during the filming. He, I think, is most famous for the Back to the Future movies, right? I think yeah. so. Yeah. Wow, but, he, you know, just like Frank Lagella, um, he was a scene stealer, you know? So. Sure. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, and his facial reaction, like, I don't want to curse the way he curses, but that one right. line is just so funny. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Uh, you so know, he, uh, he, yeah, that was a, a case of good casting. You know? Yeah, no doubt. So, yeah, he made it more palatable. Um, but like I said, the other Earth people were fine, and so was the uh, music store owner, Eddie. No, I'm not sure who his name was. It escapes me. But um, yeah. 
And then, um, but I agree with you. I, you know, I, I wish the story wasn't on earth and, um, I think that's pretty much it. Oh, you know what? I also personally, it's funny. Um, Revelation got a lot of heat for this, but uh, I personally liked how Tila was presented in her tra traditional filmation hot-headed form. You know, just like she was in the filmation show. She's, you know, she's always about to shoot the cow right <laughs> she she yeah. she wants to shoot the cow or she wants to beat up guild uh, uh Gwildor, right yeah. but yeah. he man always pulls her back you yeah. know yeah and, and um she's just quick tempered quick to react and um and you can tell also there was a little jealousy there when she sees he man with julie right and uh you know so the movie actually continued that subdued affection that we saw in the filmation show you Absolutely. know yeah and, and that was nice to see too but yeah revelation you know they they accused that show of uh, not capturing you know that tila was too too hot-headed you know and i'm like it's the way she was in the show and here she uh, was in the movie yeah. too yeah it, ha it happened so fast you don't realize she's going to shoot the cow but if you pay attention and you watch these scenes you go oh this is tila <laughs> oh look she's grabbing guldor and she wants to like knock him through the moon and he means right. like slow down tila you know he didn't know and uh yeah, <laughs> yeah. and uh it's 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 great you know i just love to see these character traits come through even though it's quite a departure from the filmation show. They they right. did pull they did pull some things, which was nice, and it makes Absolutely. me smile yeah. as a Masters of the Universe fan. And um, and the score, right? Bill Conti, the score. Do you do you love the score? I love the score, and was ecstatic. Was it? I don't know, two or three years ago, um, for Record Store Day, uh, they released it on on vinyl. And uh, I, I was living in Houston at the time and uh, ran down to my my local record store like later in the day and got their last copy of it. And it is I mean, it's magnificent. It's really, really great. And, and it's iconic. It's one of those things where you know exactly what point of the movie you're you're watching when you listen to it. And it stands on its own like I, I put that on and and it it works on its own. Yeah. Yeah. It really, you know, scores like that really, I'm always saying that a good score um, elevates the material, right? Yeah. You know, you're good on the page already, or maybe you're not good on the page, but whatever you are, it, it, it goes up a notch, you know? For and, sure. Uh, and except there was one, there was one part of his score. I don't know if you've ever watched, um, it was called Mad Max 2. What was the name in America? Uh, the Road Warrior. Okay. And um, uh, Brian May, I think, was the composer. And his music sounds exactly like the music played when um, Skeletor and he meant fight, you know, when oh, all the lights go right. down. Yeah. And it, it seems like an exact copy. I can't imagine oh, wow. he, did, he did that on purpose. Huh. But I'm I'm like, is this Mad Max 2? <laughs> huh. But, but, um, <laughs> With that similarity aside, you're right. It's so wonderful. It's yeah. so iconic. And um, that, that you just couldn't get a better score. Man. Yeah. And, and a movie like that needs needs an iconic theme. You know, I mean, it's it's I put it up there with the Superman theme. I mean, it's it's yeah. it's along those lines. And doesn't the credits in the beginning give you that sort of Christopher Reeve Superman feel? Absolutely. Right? Yeah. 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 It felt like that's what they were really going for there. And, oh, you know, yeah. and I just love it. And yeah. um, so, and unlike um, Superman, um, it did not get sequels. <laughs> <laughs> the box office was not good at all. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, the, um, this was really a box office failure. It didn't make its money back and, um, and it squashed, any ideas for a sequel? Actually, actually, maybe we're better off because Rich, there was, I don't know if you know, there was a script for a Masters of the Universe 2. Ah, I don't think I'd heard that. Yeah, I think it was called Masters of the Universe Cyborg. I am not making this up, sir. <laughs> no, that I've heard. That I've heard. 
Yeah. Yeah. I think that was canon and I think that was um a follow-up, but I heard this ridiculous idea. I didn't even go chasing the script that again it takes place on Earth. Uh, and, and then we find out the Skeletor is here on Earth, but disguised and hiding himself as this like billionaire tycoon, you know, oh corporate God. corporate villain. <laughs> and I'm like, no. <laughs> oh man. <laughs> You know, yeah, uh, let's just be glad that didn't get made. So yes, yes. If there's any time you wish a film was a failure, it's now this film because if yeah. they would have made that, oh my gosh, no, no, that would have been a uh, a laughing stock. And yeah, so, like we're still trying hard as masters masters of the universe fans to see another film realized live action film right there's been so many stops and goes and, yeah. and delays and changing of hands and right. and, and once again they were supposed to create a um they announced a new film that was going to start filming this summer and it was going to air on netflix and then that got kiboshed it's not completely kiboshed but uh. They announced filming for summer, but that got stopped, and they went back to the drawing board with writing, the director said, the Knee Brothers. And okay. um, they're doing brainstorming again. So once again, it's like a, it's like a Motu film curse. Ever since this movie, yeah. they can't seem to, to, to make another one. I don't know. Hopefully one day, you know? Yeah. I think it would resonate. I really do. I think it would yeah. resonate with people. I think it would do well. Um, I mean, it's it's one of the most recognizable brands. I mean, it it's never really died, and it it just com it it comes back, you know, completely, you know, transformed. in every couple of years, um, there's a new, you know, new ideas, and 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 they never go away. Um, I think it would. I think it would resonate. Um, yeah, I, I I know this the starts and the stops. I've stopped uh, believing anything I guess that I see about a, a new film, and I enjoy this. I enjoy what we do get, you know, with the new series and the you know the continuation of the toy lines, and and I'm seeing some really cool stuff coming out of you know Comic Con uh, that people are posting, and 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 so I know everyone would probably love to see another movie, but we get so much um, we get so much great stuff. Right. And, uh, and, and so, you know, we got to love that. Yeah. Yeah. I am super excited with the two shows that we have out now, especially yeah. masters of the universe revelation. Um, so yeah, I'm content and I'm content with this movie. So, uh, maybe we should close on our, um, our thoughts about, you know, this film, I guess then and now. So, so rich masters of the universe, 1987, what do you think? How do you feel? Capsulated. So you. in 1987, um, I'm excited for having had the experience, but I'm disappointed for a lot of reasons. First, um, so much of what was filmed for me was cut. There was a, oh. much, it was a much bigger scene and there was a lot more of me in it. And the little bit that I had, you know, got cut. Um, cause we filmed a lot more, um, what, what Skeletor said something to you, didn't he? Yeah. So, you know, after he takes his staff and turns around, um, you can see him turn around and actually look at me. And then that's what, what's cut. I'm, I'm standing there kind of like looking at him in this like pleading way. And he, you know, tells me to, you know, now leave is what he says. And, you know, I scurry off into the distance and that whole part is cut. So, I missed it actually the first time um, I saw it in the theater. So I didn't even see myself the first time because right. I was waiting for this thing that we filmed, right? That got that got cut. So I'm disappointed because where was I? Um, and then um, I'm disappointed because the credits roll and I was ecstatic to be in the credits, but pig boy, like <laughs> what? what's this right and, uh, <laughs> yeah i mean you don't want to be a nine-year-old kid you know pig boy uh you know now today i you know let's let's fast forward like 
I'm thrilled about all of it. And, and the fact that it's pig boy is hilarious to me. Right. And, and to now hear the, you know, the stories of how that, you know, how that came to be, um, you know, it's, it's cool, but yeah, I was bummed. I was bummed. It didn't, it didn't look and feel like a He-Man movie. I didn't see myself. Uh, my character's name was changed to, to something that, you know, would, would, uh, carry me through, uh, the, the, some of those, uh, formative years of like nine through 12, uh, nickname that would, you know, carry with me, uh, from the bullies. So yeah, I was bummed back then, but still excited to have had the experience. And, but how do you feel now? Just now watching this film. Yeah. It's, it's special. And, and, uh, I, again, I, I, I love how people love or hate it. I mean, you got to be pretty passionate about something to hate it as much as some people do. So even that makes it cool. It's fun, right? It's just, it's fun. And there are so many different interpretations now of He-Man. It's one of so many, right? And and so back then, all we had was the toy line and filmation, right? And this was kind of the first big sort of departure from either of those things. Now. I mean, look at what we've got now. Take your pick. And it's just one of many really cool interpretations. Um, you've got to appreciate the set for what it is. It's gorgeous, right? There's so much about, you know, the the, the costumes that are really, you know, quite, quite cool. Um, and so, yeah, and, and to, to, to the fact that we're sitting here 35 years later and we're talking about it, there aren't too many movies right, that, that that's going to happen for. So to be part of that and to see what it's what it's become today, even though at the time it was, you know, a failure, um, it's pretty amazing. It's amazing to be part of that. Yeah. You know, about your name, Pig Boy, it, it always made sense in the aspect of, um, you know, Merman, you know, and yeah. Man and, and Pig right. Boy. It's so Motu, right? Yeah, totally. Yeah, yeah. Totally. Yeah, yeah. But uh, yeah, back then um, for me, um, I remember as a child just being so excited about this film's release. You know, I, I love the vintage toys. I adored the Filmation series. Yeah. Uh, excitedly um, went to the theater a couple of years earlier in 1985 to watch the theatrical release of um, He-Man and She-Ra, The Secret of the Sword. Nice. Um, and I received this free, uh, comic book for attending, you know, oh, like, wow. yeah, it was like a miniature comic book and it was, yeah. it was, it was so cool. And, um, but this, this was live action, you know, it was the meat and potatoes. It, uh, the real deal, you know, this had the potential of being star Wars, our star mm -hmm. Wars, you know, because just, just like the, um, Star Wars uh, figures I discarded when Motu came out. Uh, Luke Skywalker had nothing on He Man, you know. <laughs> so I was just like, so excited that this uh, movie was coming out, um, and my mom took me, and I just got back after the scene, the film, and I remember just being utterly uh, disappointed. Right? Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. Skeletor had eyes and looked funny and like we mentioned before castle gray skull didn't look like castle gray skull and yeah. and um you know they didn't have that um you know they had the balance of the magic and technology but castle gray skull wasn't scary and where was prince adam and where was cringer and right battle cat i wanted to see battle cat you know yeah. just for an instance yeah and, um, you know, even if they didn't ride them, you know, just paint, they would do that back in the day. They would paint yeah. these poor, uh, what movie did they paint someone? Uh, Beastmaster, um, a film starring Mark Singer back in the eighties, they, they, they painted a tiger black and it was his Panther. You know, I don't think they would ever do that now, even though I don't think it was toxic, but I just, you know, yeah. but I guess at the time we could have had that green tiger, you know, with maybe, um, food coloring or something, whatever yeah, to make yeah. them green. Right. Right. But, uh, no, but we didn't get that. And, um, 
you know, and it was like, who are these villains? You know, they should be Merman, Trapjaw, and and Whiplash. Um, yeah. And, and why are we on Boring Earth when we could <laughs> be on Eternia? And this is the way I came out. But, you know, a uh, strange thing happened um, once I got older. And I started really liking this movie and loathing turned into loving mm. you know it turned into yeah. a complete love and and through the years i fell in love with this shakespearean skeletor you know that i want to recite his lines now yeah. you know right. and um and this corny adventure on earth i love <laughs> I love I love them on these flying discs, you know, going through the city, you know, even though sometimes it looks so fake right. and um, it, it's so corny, but it it warms my heart watching this film, you know, yeah. and it also reminds me of a more innocent time, mm -hmm. you know, and. And geez, isn't that the power of uh, movies? So, absolutely, yeah. So I just so I love this film, and uh, and I'm happy it exists. You know, so yeah. hey, hey, happy 35th anniversary, oh, Masters man. of the Universe! Cheers, cheers, cheers! cheers. Yeah. Mm. Mm. I cannot believe it's 35 years later. So. Yeah. Yeah. Don't get me depressed. Yeah. <laughs> I'd love to say I wasn't born yet, but I was born. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so, so Rich, um, before we close this out, was there anything yeah. that I might've missed that you would like to add regarding just your experience or anything else that I didn't um, touch upon? No, I don't think so. Um, it was nice to nice to chat, you know, about the about the film itself. Um, you know, I, I, I've spent some time talking about my experience, but haven't had a lot of opportunity to talk about how I feel about the film and the characters. And uh, so, I appreciate you taking that taking that uh, kind of direction here and, and perspective with me. That was a lot of fun. Um, I'm glad you had a good time. I had a great time with you. Um, if you ever want to come back, you have an open invitation to discuss other Motu other than this film, because you know this film back to front now. <laughs> <laughs> it might be fun to talk about like Revelation or, yeah. you know, or, or something else. Um, but um, yeah, that's it. Rich, um, you've been awesome. you are um, been such a pleasure. Thank you for... Uh, co-hosting the 35th, uh, 35th anniversary uh, with us. And um, thank you all out there uh, for joining us today, um, either on YouTube, Amazon, uh, Spotify, or Podbean. If you enjoyed what you heard today, please give us a like and subscribe and let us know in, in the comments. And um, for all the latest news for Masters of the Universe, Revelation, Revolution, and more, you just please visit us at foreternia.com. So again, thank you, Rich. You are completely awesome. And uh, thank, thank you. And thank you all for listening. And uh, let the power return. And don't forget to say, which you probably hear this all the time, but good journey, everyone. Have a good journey. <laughs> All right, we'll see you next time, guys. <laughs>